Hello and welcome back to The Pisky Trap, a series where we explore the folklore, history and legends from across Devon and Cornwall. It's been a while since our last full-length episode, so a big thank you to everyone who's been listening and supporting the series so far. It's lovely to be back again, and a big thank you to everyone who's been offering their lovely feedback recently as well. If you are enjoying the series and the little Pisky Bite episodes, do let me know. Give us a like and a subscribe. And please spread the word among your friends, anyone you know who might be interested in folklore and local history, because that really does help. And if you'd like to support the project further, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the Pisky Trap. Just before we get started... I always like to take a moment to give a little plug to other creative projects. And in this instance, a Pisky Trap contributor. Those of you who've been listening to the series so far may recall that way back in episode 4, we looked into the case of the Biddeford Witches, and I chatted with Professor Marion Gibson from the University of Exeter. Marion has written a number of books exploring the history of witchcraft, and her latest is entitled The Witches of St. Osith. And it's a fantastic book that explores the story surrounding the witch trials in that particular part of Essex back in the 1580s. It's a brilliant book, and if you're interested in the history of cunning folk, witchcraft, folklore and superstition, then I highly recommend grabbing yourself a copy. Right then, let's crack on with the episode. If you're ever in the far west of Cornwall, and you're heading towards Land's End, the last little village that you'll pass through is called Churchtown, part of Senon. Just past the church there is a pub called the First and Last Inn. Now, if you were to do a quick Google search of the pub, one of the first things to pop up would be the story of what they call Annie's Shadow. It's a local ghost story, and those of you who've been listening for a while now will know how much I love a good local ghost story, so of course I wanted to look into this a bit further. According to Nicola Sly in her ghostly almanac of Devon and Cornwall, there's a particular room in the pub that's associated with Anne or Annie. She says, even though long dead, It seems as though Anne still wishes to lay claim to the bedroom at the inn that was once hers. People sleeping there are said to have suffered from terrible nightmares. She goes on to say that many have reported the slamming of doors and windows. Parts of the pub suddenly grow very cold. People walking on the stairs, particularly on the landing, have reported feeling as if they're being watched or followed. And several have said that they've felt as if they've been touched by unseen hands. There have even been reports of an apparition of a woman appearing at the side of the bed in the room associated with Anne. So, in this episode, it's the story behind the ghost of Anne and the historical events surrounding this particular tale that I want to explore and delve a little bit deeper. It's all set at the beginning of the 19th century, in and around the village of Senon, and focuses around a woman named Anne George. All of this is caught up with the local smuggling operation, a theme that crops up quite a bit. It even cropped up in one of the little pisky bites the other day. There are rumours of smugglers' tunnels in and around the first and last pub, possibly connecting with other buildings. All of this is, is really typical with these sort of tales. Smuggling is such a big part of Cornwall's past that it seems almost inevitable that it becomes tied up with local folklore. This is a tale of local disputes, betrayal, court trials, and ultimately has a rather tragic outcome. Hopefully I've piqued your interest there. So, without further ado, allow me to introduce our next episode, The Smugglers of Senon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Back in 1870, William Bottrell's book, Traditions and Hearthside Stories of West Cornwall, was first published. Bottrell had grown up in the far west of Cornwall, so he'd collected together a lot of old drolls and stories from that part of the county, and we've explored some of them before. But something that stuck with me are the opening words to the first volume, where he describes the area of West Penwith and what it was like before he was born and when he was growing up as a young boy. He begins with the following, and I quote, Before the commencement of the present century, the district of West Penwith, to which the legends in this volume for the most part belong, was, from its almost insular position, one of the most secluded and unknown parts of England. The estuary of Hale, by which it is bounded on the east, and the Mounts Bay approaching to within three miles of each other, sever it in some measure from the rest of the county, with which, some threescore years ago, from the badness of the roads and scarcity of wheel conveyances, it had but little communication, either commercially or otherwise. Then persons living west of Penzance were regarded as great travellers if they had crossed over Hale, which at that time was a dangerous undertaking on account of its shifting quicksands. End quote. I think he's clearly there trying to give us a sense of just how isolated the far west of Cornwall may have been back in the 18th century and the very beginning of the 19th. And it's during this period, in the first couple of years of the 1800s, that the events in this story appear to have taken place within the village of Senon. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with the place, if you were to follow the southwest coast path along the north coast, heading west, Senon would be the last village that you come to before reaching Land's End. So, it's really at that far western tip of Cornwall. There's a brilliant article by the Cornish Bird, which I'll pop a link to in the show notes, exploring Senon's importance as a small port, particularly in the medieval period. But going there now, even in the 21st century, Senon, although it's grown and it's expanded over the years, still feels like it's kind of out there on its own and, and pretty remote. There's a quote from Highways and Byways of Devon and Cornwall from 1900, which reads, The wide curving strand lies very lonely now, and it is many a day since any shipping has been seen there save fisher boats. So, in essence, by the time we're looking at around 1800, you've got an isolated fishing community. It's pretty much the perfect setting for tales of smuggling. I'm not going to delve too deeply into the whole history of smuggling, as I feel like we've explored that quite a bit in the episode on Zephaniah Job. Instead, I'm just going to give a little bit of context for the events in this story. I should say that a number of the following bits that I've gathered come from an article by Sarah Pritchard from the Vingo family website entitled The Smugglers of Senon. We know that during this period Cornwall still had this huge reputation for smuggling. But at the very beginning of the 1800s the, the crown was at war with France, so it's kind of preoccupied to say the least. And in 1803 a proclamation is issued stating that any smugglers who'd previously fled the country could, provided they weren't accused of a crime like murder, return to the country, provided they agreed to sign a bond and refrain from any further smuggling activities. However, as you might imagine, many were soon lured back into the trade, and very soon there was a real resurgence in smuggling, basically. One of those lured back was a character named Christopher Pollard from Madron, which is also in West Cornwall, near Penzance and Haymore. A few years before, Christopher had apparently fled to Guernsey after being accused of assaulting and obstructing the excise men. In fact, I found a record from Newgate Prison up in London, and among the omissions of prisoners dated the 21st of November 1799, is a man named Christopher Pollard, 
it tells us he's about 30 years old, from Penzance, 5 foot 8, and blind in one eye. We're told he was admitted for a misdemeanour and sentenced to one year in Newgate Prison. Now, you might be thinking, Newgate up in London? That's, that's miles away. But for those of you who listened to the Paul Perrow episode, you might remember us talking about prisoners being taken up to London for smuggling-related offences because there was a higher likelihood of conviction. So maybe that's what was happening here. Whether this is definitely the same Christopher Pollard is difficult to say, but it's certainly possible. Though it begs the question of how and when he fled to Guernsey. Whatever the exact details, we're told that sometime in 1804, Christopher was back in Cornwall again, and he'd agreed to sign this bond. In fact, another man from Madron called Robert Parsons had stood surety for the sum of £200, effectively taking legal responsibility for Pollard sticking to his agreement. But as you've probably guessed, it isn't long before Christopher is up to his old tricks again maybe even utilising those contacts that he'd made while he was in Guernsey. According to Sandra Pritchard, some months later, in 1805, he was charged that, and I quote, The accused had assaulted the officers of HM Excise when occupied in their duty at Senan, and had incited a crowd of three or four hundred persons to attack the excise men with a view to carrying off the smuggled goods, which they had captured, and were defending on the beach. This landing was indeed a valuable one, consisting as it did of 1,000 gallons of brandy, 1,000 gallons of rum, 1,000 gallons of Geneva, which is gin, and 500 pounds of tobacco. Now, I've looked at the session records from the Old Bailey, and those are the numbers that are stated and seem to kind of tally roughly with people's statements as well. To give some context, I think a standard keg of beer in the UK is something like 11 gallons. So that should give you some idea of the quantities we're talking about. So it's fair to say this was a pretty big haul of smuggled goods. It seems that when this case came to trial, Pollard admitted to being part owner of these goods but stated that earlier that day he'd met a farmer by the name of Poole in Penzance, who was accompanying him to Senan and providing him with horses to transport all this contraband. He claims that the two of them arrived at Senan to find the goods had already been confiscated by the revenue men, that there was this big altercation going on at the beach between the locals and the officers, and rather than getting involved, he and Paul decided to go home. So, to summarise, there's been this big altercation on the beach, the revenue men have come to seize this large haul of goods, the locals have retaliated, and Christopher Pollard is accused of obstructing and assaulting those officers and inciting others to do the same. But he claims he didn't get involved in this skirmish, if you like. I want to dig a bit deeper into the events down in the cove at Senan that night, the 10th of January, 1805. It's at this point that it's fitting to introduce this character of Anne George, or Annie, as some writers refer to her. It seems that the main witness for the prosecution in the case against Pollard was this woman, Anne George. A 20th century Cornish historian named Arthur Kenneth Hamilton Jenkin, or A.K. Hamilton Jenkin as he's often known, describes her by saying, and I quote, This woman, it appears, was a person of notorious character. At the time of the trial, she is described as being the wife of Joseph George, who up to a short time before had been the keeper of the Senan Inn a place which had the reputation of being the resort of all the idle blackguards in the county. End quote. So, uh, that's, that's quite an introduction. But what do we know about Anne and her husband, Joseph? Well, um, it's been very tricky trying to research this, as records are pretty thin on the ground. 
And a lot of the information that exists on Anne in particular is all bound up with this case or the subsequent folklore around it. I found a marriage record for an Anne Nicholas who married Joseph George at St Burian in October 1798 and I think it, it's highly likely this is them. Now, their ages aren't given on that record but I found separate birth records for Joseph in 1777 and I found an Anne Nicholas born in Senan in 1773. So, if these are the right records and the right people, it's possible Anne was maybe a couple of years older, but it's looking like by 1805 they would have been a couple in their late 20s, early 30s. That brings us to this Senan Inn that's apparently frequented by blackguards. I said at the outset that the stories and legends surrounding Anne come from the pub now known as the First and Last. But there seems to be a, a bit of uncertainty over whether the pub where Anne and her husband Joseph had lived was in fact the one up in Churchtown, or whether it was the pub in Senan Cove itself, which is now called the Old Success, but appears to have been called the Ship at one point. So there's some disagreement and debate as to the location of this pub, but we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later. It looks like the case against Christopher Pollard wasn't the first time that Anne had been a witness for the prosecution in a smuggling case. We're told that she'd also had an altercation with her landlord. The man who is said to have owned the pub at this time, and which Joseph and Anne had rented, was a well-to-do farmer and a local landowner with <laughs> the fantastic name of Dionysius Williams, who's said to have been a leading figure in the local smuggling operation. I'm quoting again from Jenkin here, who writes, Presuming on the secret hold which they possessed over their landlord, through the knowledge of his illicit transactions, the Georges had for some time refused to pay any rent for the inn, and at length the owner, very unwisely, had decided to eject them. Infuriated by this, the innkeeper's wife had thereupon turned King's evidence against Williams, and reaped her revenge in seeing the latter served with a long term of imprisonment. End quote. So, we're told that they essentially try to get out of paying their rent on the pub, but Dionysius evicts them, and in retaliation Anne turns King's evidence and effectively shops him out to the authorities. Not, I imagine, a popular thing to do when you consider that most people in communities like Senan were probably involved in the smuggling trade in one way or another. Now, so far, I haven't been able to find a court or a size record for this case against Williams. But that's not to say that there isn't one out there, somewhere. Or it might be that the records may simply be lost. Sandra Pritchard in her Smugglers of Senan is quite sceptical about elements of this story relayed by Jenkin, particularly when it comes to the case against Williams, and says, I would have been very surprised if any jury had convicted him, let alone one composed entirely of his peers. And I'm inclined to agree with her here. I, I don't think anyone locally would have convicted Williams, given how many people supported the smuggling trade, and given his standing and his influence in that community as well. Jenkin goes on to tell us that he was shown a brief to counsel by a Penzance solicitor by the name of J.A.D. Bridger, which says of Anne, The villainy of the woman's character, however is best revealed by the account, given in the same brief, of a quarrel which she had some years previously with her brother-in-law, John George, over a few pounds of tobacco. In this case also she had turned King's evidence, accused the victim of her malice of firing on a revenue officer, and so incriminated him that the poor wretch was actually convicted and hanged on the 5th of June, 1802. Now, 
we know for a fact that John George was indeed the brother of Joseph George, and so Anne's brother-in-law. But I haven't found a record for an incident in 1802. I wonder if there's just been a confusion and they're actually referring to this same incident on the beach on that same night in 1805. I have managed to find a record for the trial of one John George from the records of the Old Bailey. So here again we have an example of a case involving smuggling being taken to London for trial. And the offence is often listed as something like, a, as we encountered earlier, a misdemeanour. So I have here the trial record dated the 24th of April 1805 which lists the indictment against John George, and it reads as follows. John George was indicted for that he, with diverse other persons, to the jurors unknown, to the number of three persons and more, being armed with firearms, guns, pistols, pikes, swords, and large stones, unlawfully did assemble themselves together, aiding, abetting, assisting, rescuing, and taking away from William Parry, an officer of our Lord the King, a thousand gallons of brandy, rum, and Geneva, and five hundred pounds weight of tobacco, being respectively uncustomed goods after the seizure of the said goods. Second count, for that he, with diverse others, together on the same day and in the same place, being armed with firearms aforesaid, in order to be aiding, abetting, assisting, and rescuing and carrying away the like goods, being uncustomed goods which had not been paid and liable to be seized and secured. End quote. We actually have quite a lot of specific detail from various different testimonies of what happened on the beach that night, and some of it is very reminiscent of similar altercations and skirmishes, whatever you want to call them between the smugglers and the revenue men in the Polpero area. Essentially, on the evening of the 10th of January 1805, a revenue officer by the name of William Parry, who's the mate of a cutter called the Resolution, observes another cutter by the name of the Maria, and obviously assumes it's carrying contraband. So they pursue it, and Parry and a party of 13 men go on shore at Senan Cove. For the next bit, I'm going to read directly from the court transcript where Parry is examined by a Mr Fielding, who begins by asking, and I quote, You were going in the execution of your duty to search for the supposed cargo of the Maria. I did, and when I went on shore, I heard several muskets fired. There were not any shots in the muskets. I did not hear any shots whistle. Could you perceive from whence the firing came? Yes, from the village. Was it near the place where you found the casks piled up? Close to it. How many reports of pieces were there? About half a dozen or more. Fired at once or successively? At different times, and several stones were thrown at me and my crew just after we landed. When the stones were thrown at you, what number of people were there? I could not see many of them just at that time. They all ran away and went behind hedges or corners of houses. There might be half a dozen or more. The stones were thrown at you, and some of your men were hurt by the stones at that time? I ordered my men to return the fire to clear the beach. In order to intimidate and clear the place, your men fired. Yes, I, I made a seizure of 100 anchors that lay on the beach, below high water mark, very near where I first landed. And after that I found out 300 anchors on the quay. So, just as a bit of a reference, and it's always tricky trying to convert weights and measurements from different eras, but it seems like an anchor is roughly 10 gallons. So we're talking around 4,000 gallons they've seized there. And this all seems to have happened sometime around 8 o'clock in the evening. We're told that it wasn't totally dark, there was a good deal of moonlight, and Parry and his men 
basically bring small boats ashore to secure the seizure of these goods. Having initially scattered when the officers fired back, it, it seems that the smugglers then come back down onto the beach. Parry says, In the course of the evening, there were several men came down that appeared to be smugglers, while I was taking care of the seizure, one of which was a tall man of five foot ten, with a whip in his hand, a greatcoat and boots. He insinuated to me to give up half the seizure. In the trial, Fielding goes on to ask him if he refused to do that. Yes, Joseph George and his wife came down frequently and informed me that the smugglers intended to attack me and rescue the goods. Did his wife come down with him the first time? No. Then Joseph George came down to apprise you of their intention. Yes, the smugglers came down often from eight o'clock in the evening till one o'clock in the morning. About one o'clock in the morning, they began to attack us with firearms and stones in great numbers. There's another testimony given by a seaman serving aboard the Resolution, who was there on the beach with Parry, and in fact is hit by some of the shots that are fired during the course of the night. His name is Thomas Pyle, and he tells us what happened at about one in the morning when things really started to kick off. There was a man that came to us and shook hands with several of us, and shook hands with me in particular, and said, Men, be honourable, and we will be the same to you. Then he went away, and said, Damn and bugger the first that turns Judas, and went up the hill to the mob, and gave three cheers, one and all. Then they began heaving stones, and fired one musket in the first place. After that, there seems to have been a number of muskets fired, and this forms the basis of Fielding's next line of questioning in the trial. How many firearms might be discharged? A vast number, I suppose, 30 or 40 muskets? Distinct muskets and, and, and several discharges. Were any of your men hurt with the discharge of the first firing? The very first fire of the muskets, one of my men was wounded in the head. In consequence of having received their fire, what was done by you and your men? Then we returned the fire as fast as we could. They were behind the boats. We could not get at them, only when they came down in great numbers upon us. So that they fired upon you from sheltered places, from behind boats and houses. How long might this sort of work continue? Upwards of an hour. Was there a constant firing kept up by you for the course of an hour? Yes, we fired upon them the whole time. In what manner did they first come on upon you? They came upon us in a large number, huzzahing. During this, were any more of your men hurt than you have described? Four more wounded, three dangerously. Joseph George continued with you during this time? He did. Had you any opportunity during this time of observing any other persons, so as to be able to identify them? Not very well. Joseph George was in the place, and knew most of the men who were there. In better than an hour the firing ceased. Did any of them make any approach to you after one o'clock? Yes, and they hallowed out, leave the goods. Thomas Pyle is also asked if he recognised any of the smugglers, and he identifies John George, saying that he'd definitely seen him on the beach at around ten o'clock, and recognised him because he'd seen him before. Now, it gets interesting because we hear for the first time from Anne George herself. Now, obviously, it's a court transcript that's been written down by someone else so we might have to take some of the exact wording and phrasing with a pinch of salt, but it reads as follows. Joseph George was at Senan Cove. He had been to Penzance Market. I have every reason to believe that he had something to do with the officers. I believe it must be eight o'clock when he first went down. About nine, I was sitting down playing a game of cards when in came a young woman in a few minutes after that, I went to the house of James Thomas, and when I came in there, the wife of James Thomas asked me whether I had heard the piece of work there was in the cove. She said there was murder in the cove, and one man shot, 
I went to the cove and found Mr. William Parry and 13 more of the crew with a large quantity of goods and the men walking up and down with their arms and cutlasses. When I came there, I saw my husband talking with his brother, the prisoner. I afterwards went down with this said John George, by the desire of Joseph George, to ask Mr. Parry whether he would make him any satisfaction for the boat that had been seized before of John George. He asked Mr. William Parry if he could do it. He said it was more than his commission was worth to do anything of the kind. If he would stop till the morning and he would endeavour to help him, he would make him a generous satisfaction. He said it was very hard for him to lose his boat, and he was not in it. It was very hard upon him. So it seems that after this brief chat with Parry, John goes away pretty dissatisfied, and according to Anne's account, she and John and a couple of others then went back to John's house. John then asks Joseph to step outside for a word. Now, we don't know what was said, but according to Anne, John returned angry. A few minutes later, Anne goes out again to look for her husband, who has returned to William Parry down at the beach. Anne then says, Going past a place that I had to go through in going from the house of John George towards my own house, I saw a large party of men assembled together. I saw the prisoner, John George, standing in conversation with a large party assembled around with Richard Oates. And the words that I heard him express was that though he was his own brother, he would shoot him like a blackbird. I had every reason to think it was on his brother he then said it, who was my husband. So, <laughs> some pretty dramatic stuff there. This was sometime between 11pm and midnight. Apparently, John George had told the assembled men that his brother Joseph had informed to the revenue officer. And according to Anne's testimony, they gave three cheers and said they would kill Joseph and take away the goods. That if they allowed them to take Joseph and would surrender the contraband, they would simply take the goods. Or they would go down in a large group and fire on them until the revenue cutter was forced to retreat. Thomas Pyle, the man who received musket fire, is then asked where the shots that struck him came from, and he says, from among the boats. Anne is then asked whether she saw John carrying a gun, and she says yes, and that she saw him standing with it outside the home of a man named William Pendar. There's also talk of a pike being grabbed at one point, but that's a little more unclear. Pyle is asked if he received a shot from anyone near the house. Presumably they're asking whether it could have been fired by John. Pyle replies, and I quote, I received a single shot from the end of the house, but who fired the musket I cannot say. It struck me, but it did not go into my flesh. Anne is then pressed as to whether she saw John firing the musket, and she replies, I have every reason to believe that he fired, but whether there was anything in the gun, I do not know. It seems a bit strange at first, this idea of firing with no shot. But I chatted recently with Swashbuckling Cornwall, so a shout out to them, and this seems like something you would have done as a warning shot perhaps, or maybe if you don't have a lot of ammunition, but you're trying to keep up a volley of constant firing. So, if the musket was fired but without shot, essentially what they call dry firing, this perhaps explains why Pyle wasn't seriously hurt by it. But nevertheless, discharging a weapon and firing on a revenue officer is a serious offence. I think it's interesting to hear from John George himself next. There's only a small amount of the transcript that's given over to his defence, but here's the bulk of it. I heard Richard Oates say, in William Pendar's house, that they had sent of 100 kegs on horses, and as soon as they came back again, they would attempt to take the goods. They came back and tapped a keg of brandy and told the men to drink. Then they began directly. A great number of men came along with these horses 
and they would not do anything till such time as these men did come. Several persons came with them, some eight or ten miles, but I do not rightly know where. They came from all parts, intending to carry the goods off. As soon as ever they came, they began directly. They gave three cheers. They heaved stones. I saw Francis Gardell and Robert Nichols go by the end of a house with a musket apiece in their hands. Nancy George was not where I was at the time she says she saw me with a gun. I find it interesting that he calls her Nancy, a shortened form or pet name for Anne. So perhaps that's how most people, or at least her family, knew her. Anne is questioned again about where she saw John when he was holding the gun, and she repeats that he was outside William Pendar's house. John then asks the officers whether any of them received any damage from him in particular. Pyle replies that he did receive a couple of shots from among the boats that seemed to have wounded him, but a single shot was fired from by the house. He couldn't tell who it was and reiterates that it struck him but didn't injure him. In the last couple of bits that we see in John's defence, he himself questions his brother Joseph. When you went up to my house along with me, did you hear me say anything about taking those goods away? Not to my knowledge, I did not. Did you see me when I went down there at night, or hear me say anything concerning it when I went down to Mr. Parry? I did not hear any person speak about it then. I, I heard about it when I was with Christopher Pollard. There might then be about twenty or thirty men there. I went down and told Mr. Parry. One thing that's interesting. Towards the end of the trial, Anne is asked by the jury whether her and her brother-in-law had been on good terms before this. And she replies, Yes, I never had an angry word from him in my life, nor any of his family. Frustratingly, that's pretty much where the transcript ends. Nevertheless, there's a fair amount of detail in there. Enough to give us a sense, I think, of what happened that night. After this skirmish on the beach that seems to have gone on for some hours, throughout the night and into the following morning, Parry and his officers do succeed in seizing the contraband. In fact, John George was paid two guineas by a Captain Stoneham, that's the captain of the Resolution, employed to get a boat and assist in getting 41 anchors aboard the Resolution. That was at seven in the morning. And at the time, Parry says he had no suspicion that John might have been involved in resisting the seizure the night before. It's an interesting story and a fascinating insight. But what's the outcome of all this? Well, the final words from the trial record simply read, Guilty. Death. This was in an era still referred to as the Bloody Code, when offences against public revenue, including smuggling, were a capital offence. So John, presumably as a result of the testimonies including Anne's and Joseph's, is sentenced to be executed. At this point, you're probably wondering what happened to the man we mentioned at the outset, Christopher Pollard, who was also tried at the Old Bailey for inciting people to riot and obstructing the revenue men. There's an article I found in the Public Ledger and Daily Advertiser, dated the 11th of July 1805, recording the sessions at the Old Bailey, which begins, and I quote, Three were acquitted among whom was Christopher Pollard, indicted for a misdemeanour, in obstructing the crew of His Majesty's cutter the Resolution, whilst making a seizure of contraband goods. End quote. So, why is it that John is sentenced to death? And yet, Christopher Pollard seems to have, well, gotten away with it. I've come across another article, from the same date in fact, in the Sun newspaper, which reads, 
the accounts varied materially with respect to the prisoner's dress. The jury retired for some time and returned a verdict of acquittal. So, in other words, there were conflicting testimonies, no one could positively identify Pollard as having been there, seemingly because they couldn't agree on what he was wearing that night, and on that basis, they let him off. As for John, I've found his name in the Newgate calendar of prisoners, dated the 26th of April, and it simply lists his name, the offence and the verdict. But there's an article in The Englishman, dated the 2nd of June, 1805, that reads, On Thursday, the recorder made a report to His Majesty in Council of the convicts under sentence of death in Newgate, when William Field and John George were ordered for execution on Wednesday next. That means that John would have been taken to the scaffold erected outside Newgate Prison, along with William Field, who'd been arrested for forgery. And there, both men were hanged in public, probably by a man named William Curry, who was the executioner around that time, on the 5th of June, 1805. There's so many questions about this relationship between John, Anne and Joseph. The impact that this would have had on the family and the community in and around Senan. We know that Anne gave evidence against John and Christopher Pollard. There's also these rumours that she may have shopped out Dionysius Williams. And... It's also clear from the court record that Joseph had been assisting the revenue officers and had warned them that the smugglers were coming to confront them. Given that even in Anne's testimony, she talks about the threats that were made against Joseph for being a so-called Judas, you have to wonder what the reaction would have been once they returned to Senan. This is the point in the story where things become less clear and start to blend into local folklore and legend, and the tale takes a decidedly darker turn. I'm quoting here again from Nicola Sly's Ghostly Almanac of Devon and Cornwall, where she writes, Legend has it that the villagers of Senan swore revenge on Anne George for standing witness against her brother-in-law, and that when she returned to the village, she was horribly murdered by being staked on the beach at low tide and covered with fishing nets. As the tide rose, she was drowned. Once the tide had receded again, Anne George's body was taken back to the first and last inn, where it was laid out in one of the first-floor bedrooms, before being buried in an unmarked grave in the cemetery next door to the pub. End quote. It's quite a story, and it's one that crops up again and again in books like Haunted Pubs of the Southwest by Ian Adicote, and a wide range of similar books and websites on the subject. All of them tell this same tale of Anne's macabre demise. And I suppose this is the point in the story where it really becomes attached to the first and last inn. I'm afraid that, as yet, I haven't been able to find any accounts, any primary sources or records for Anne's death or her burial from around that time. So I can't say for certain what happened to her and whether there's any truth to the legend. Firstly, it can be difficult trying to find records 200 years later. And secondly, if there were any truth to the tale, surely the community would want it kept quiet. So who knows? Coming back to the pub and its connection to this story, 
Sandra Pritchard makes some interesting points about the Ship Inn in Senan Cove, because the lease seems to have been held by members of the George family for many decades afterwards. But Pritchard says of Joseph and Anne, and I quote, If she was responsible for splitting on her brother-in-law, John George, they may have been regarded as pariahs by the rest of the family who threw them out. In the 1841 census, there's a Matthew George listed as the publican. At the time, he's 50 years old and seems to have been a younger brother to Joseph and John. At some point in the late 1800s, the pub changed its name to the Old Success and the Georges continued with the lease until at least 1891. So where does the first and last come into all of this? And how did the confusion about the location come about? Well, Sandra Pritchard writes that the first and last, and a lot of land local to Churchtown, was owned by the Vingo family, and an Eleanor Vingo married a John George in 1761. He was from a whole other family, also called George, living in and around the same area, and distantly related to the Georges of Senan Cove. So, maybe Anne was at the first and last, and the different families and stories have become muddled over the centuries. To be honest, it gets very confusing. There's even questions as to whether the John George executed at Newgate in 1805 was the same John George, or a different one altogether, as there's a John George who crops up in other Senan records years later. As to what really happened to Anne and Joseph after the trial, I'm not sure that we'll ever know for certain. But who knows, maybe records will be unearthed at some point that can shed some light. I, for one, aim to keep researching. Whether there's any truth to the tale of Anne's demise, or whether it's one of those stories that's been embellished over the years that's evolved, perhaps drawing inspiration from other local stories, and taken on a life of its own, becoming interwoven with local history, who can say? In the meantime, stories still persist that the first and last is haunted by Anne. Visitors claim to have suffered sleepless nights, tormented by dreams of drowning, of a shortness of breath, and some still see the spectre of a lady on the landing. Something I should say is that quite some years ago now, I was doing some research as part of a radio play I wanted to put together about smuggling in Cornwall. And that was when I first encountered this story. During the course of my research, I made a rather interesting discovery. When I joined the Actors' Union Equity, I had to take on a stage name. My family name is George. And it seems that John and Joseph George were my five times great uncles. And therefore, Anne would in fact be my five times great aunt. So... Alongside its ties to Cornwall's smuggling past and the intrigue of this local ghost story, this tale was one that I particularly wanted to explore. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you think that the ghost story has any basis in fact, or do you think it's all just a local legend? If you're a local researcher, a historian, and you've found out any details that perhaps we uh, haven't uncovered or talked about, or you've got your own theories about the smugglers of Senan, and maybe which pub should lay claim to being Anne and Joseph's one-time home, then let me know. You can get in touch on Instagram at the Pisky Trap, or you can email me at thepiskytrap at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. I highly recommend checking out the Senan Smugglers website. I'll pop a link to that in the show notes. So thanks to Sarah Pritchard for all her hard work on that. 
I recommend checking out the website for The First and Last Inn as well. That has the story of Annie's shadow and the haunting, as well as the old success in Senan Cove. You can also find the trial of John George with the testimonies by both Anne and Joseph on the Old Bailey Records online. For all the other sources, you can check out the link to the book list for this series. That's it for this episode of The Pisky Trap. We'll be back again very soon with some exciting new collaborations. The Pisky Trap is written and presented by me, Keith Wallace, with music by Elizabeth Westcott and artwork by Caris Harrington. Thanks for listening.